Hey there, it's Jason Gorman with a video about mutation testing in JavaScript. What is mutation testing? Well, I think probably the best way to explain mutation testing would be to demonstrate. The example I'm going to be demonstrating with is a, uh, a Mars rover exercise I did. It's always a Mars rover. You'll soon learn that in these videos. Um, the idea basically is that we've got a Mars rover. Here's the implementation of it here. And we can send it sequences of instructions, F to move it forward one square, B to move it back one square, um, L to turn it to the, the, the left, or R to turn it to the right. And it will execute this sequence of instructions. You'll see we've got the code to do all of that here, um, returning a, a copy of the rover that has been turned or moved in some way. Um, now, I would like to refactor this code, lots of nasty nested if statements and all sorts of duplication and horrible things going on there. But before I refactor it, I need to ask a very important question, which is, if I were to break this code, would I know? And for that, we need a good suite of regression tests. Now, I have some tests here, 17 in total, uh, for my Mars rover that I think, I think are pretty good. So I'm getting a warm, fuzzy feeling about these tests, but hmm, Maybe I need to be a bit more scientific about this. Now, one tool we can use to give us a feel for how much faith we might want to put in our tests is to measure the, uh, the, the code coverage um, of, the, um, of the tests. In other words, how much of our solution code, how much of our rover code is actually executed when we run our tests. So we can run a coverage report. Let's do one now. Let's run these tests with coverage. I'm using NYC. Um, so let's take a look at the app here. Well, 100% 100, 100 of our lines of code are covered. Um, so we can take a look inside our source file. Uh, 100, yeah, 100% basically. But just because all of our tests are passing and just because all of our solution code is being executed by the tests, that doesn't necessarily mean that that code is actually really being tested. It is quite possible to have 100% coverage with tests that, are, that are, don't ask particularly good questions. So you can pretty much drive a bus through them in terms of breaking the code. So how could we get a better understanding, a deeper understanding of how good our tests are at catching broken code? This is where mutation testing comes in. I'm going to demonstrate this manually. What we do is we take a copy of our source code like this. And we perform a mutation to a line of code. That is, we change the line of code in some simple way, such that it's still syntactically correct. We can still run it and run our tests. But we know that that code is broken. For example, if we would change instruction equals r here to instruction not equals r, that's wrong. That's definitely wrong. And then what we do is we run, we run our tests again. I'll do them from the command line. And we say, well, do, do any of our tests actually catch this mutated version of the code? And the answer is they do. Some of our tests, quite a few of our tests, by the looks of it, are failing. So what we say here is that our test suite has killed this mutant. So if we were to break this line of code, we could have reasonable confidence that at least one test would catch that. So it's a way of testing your tests by deliberately breaking the code. Let's undo that change. OK, and what we would do is we would go through line by line. Let's let what else could we do to a here's a Boolean expression. We could replace that with another Boolean expression like true. Again, that's obviously wrong. Let's rerun our tests. See what happens. And again, our test suite has killed the mutant. So we can have confidence that that line of code, if it were broken, um, at least one of our tests would fail. And we can go through line by line, systematically mutating, turning equals into not equals, or turning Boolean expressions into true or false randomly. Um, if we're returning a number, maybe replace that number with zero, or if it's a numerical expression, replace it with zero or minus one or something like that. So essentially, we've got something that, that, that can run, but is obviously wrong, a mutated version of it. And then line by line, we can test whether or not our test suites kill that mutant. Is that line of code really being tested? 
And that gives us a feel to how much confidence we can place in our test suite. Now, I could do this all by hand and go through every line of code, but that's going to be very laborious and very boring for you to watch. So you'll be delighted to know there are tools that can do this for us automatically, mutation testing tools. There is a tool for JavaScript called Striker, which is the one I'm going to be using. Let's take a look at the home page, striker-mutator.io. I'll post a link in the description below. You will see there are multiple versions now. There's a C Sharp and a Scala version. The one we're interested in is JavaScript. Let's go to the JavaScript homepage. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to install this so you can see how that's done. And then we'll, we'll have a play with it. OK, so I've got two options here about how to install it. I can install it globally. I'm not going to do that for this tiny little project. So what I'm going to do is I'll use the instructions here as to how to install it for this project. So in my terminal here, I just paste that in. It's kind of a two-stage install. So what it'll do, first of all, is download and unpack those files. Off it goes. Quite a lot to it. These, these folks have been very busy. OK, lovely. And then the second part of that is, because we've got it installed locally, we need to configure it the way we want it. So we're going to use init. OK, and that's going to ask us a bunch of questions about how we want this tool configured. So you'll see it supports, as well as sort of vanilla JavaScript, it supports a bunch of frameworks here. We don't need to worry about those for what we're doing. We're just plain old vanilla Java on Node. I'm going to be um, running my tests with Mocha, and I'm going to be writing them with Mocha as well. Plain JavaScript, thank you very much, but it also supports TypeScript and Vue, which is handy. So it supports transpilers. Talking of which, um, we don't need any of these, so it doesn't need translating into anything, so no thank you. In terms of outputs, we'll get a command line output, which will tell us, give us an overview of our coverage. Um, but if we want to drill down into that, we probably want the HTML output. So we'll take that, thank you very much. And we're using npm to manage our packages. And config file, well, that JSON seems fine. Okay, so it's going to configure that the way we want it, and then we'll be in a position in a minute to run a coverage report. OK, so we've seen that we have 100% code coverage from our tests, and that make us, might make us feel all warm and fuzzy. But let's find out. Let's really test our tests. So let's run Striker. Now, what it's going to do by default um, is it's going to look in the source folder for source code to mutate. And then it'll use, uh, because I've told it to use Mocha, it'll use npm test uh, with the Mocha test. So that's all set up ready to go in my um, package.json file. So it'll use that to run the test after each mutation. It's going to perform a bunch of mutations on each line of code. So we just run it with all the defaults, and it should, fingers crossed, work. Off it goes. So it's crunching my code, performing these mutations. Now, obviously, if there's a lot of source code, that might take a while. There's a lot of work to do. Um, but you'll be delighted to hear you don't this is not something you'll be doing like every five minutes. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. There we go. Ah, OK. Interesting. So 100% of my code is executed by the test, but one of our mutants survived. It was able to change one line of code, I think. Um, and um, that didn't break any tests. Now, what could that be about? Let's drill down into this. Let's take a look at the HTML report. So we'll open that in Chrome. There we go. So we can start drilling down. This is the same stats that we had before. But now we can click on our folders and files and take a look at the code. So the stats are at the top. Um, the code that's highlighted in green here, basically, our tests killed those mutants. It performed mutations, and we don't need to worry about those. But as we scroll down, aha, OK. So it made a mutation to this line of code here. What did it do? Let's click on that. Ah. It replaced that conditional expression with true. And none of our tests failed. Now, why might that be, I wonder? I think I know what this is about. If we take a look at our source code here. 
So our source code handles R for our right, L for turn left, F for go forward, B for go back. Now B, if instruction equals B, is the last option. And we're not handling anything else. So B essentially is the default. In other words, if it's not right, left, or forward, it must be back. But is that the way it should be? What if, for example, I were to send it an invalid instruction, an instruction that the rover doesn't recognize? In this particular instance, I don't think we're handling that. I don't think our implementation handles that. There's no drop through, there's no default here. So underneath here, nothing happens. We don't return a copy of the rover. We don't throw an error or whatever. So, so we've got the wrong default here. Essentially, B for back, go backwards, is the default, and it shouldn't be. So our mutation testing has found a gap. And that gap exists because it's actually a gap in the tests. If you take a look at our tests here. We're testing all of the valid instructions and sequences of valid instructions, but we are not testing what happens if we send it an unrecognized instruction. So let's add a test for that. So it ignores. Let's, let's say that we want it to ignore invalid instructions. OK. So this will be quite similar to the test before it. But what we're actually saying here is that our rover should be unchanged. So if it was facing, say, north to begin with, it should still be facing north. And if its position was 5-5 five, five to begin with, its position should still be 5-5. Five, five. OK, so let's initialize our rover here. So it's at 5.5 five facing north. And I'm going to tell it to do something it doesn't know to do. And we will see what it does. Go X. No such thing. Now what we're saying here is what should happen is it says, nope, ignoring that. Don't know what that means. Let's run that test and see what happens. OK, we have a failing test because our implementation has no default. So we need to add a line of code here to return a copy of the rover unchanged. But it probably doesn't even need to be a copy. We can just return the rover since it's not being mutated. There's an overloaded term for you. Um, so let's rerun that test. In fact, let's run all of them. OK, so I think we filled a gap there that's been highlighted by our mutation tests. But let's find out. So we'll crunch through it again. There you go. Wow, 100%. So through mutation testing uh, uh, this code, we discovered that there was um, not just a gap in our tests, but a gap in the logic, a gap in the implementation that we hadn't considered, um, that we should have considered. And now having filled that gap, we've got a score of 100%. That is every mutation that was performed, our tests killed the mutant. So that is mutation testing. It is a powerful and useful technique for essentially discovering gaps in your tests and for determining how much faith we should put in our test suites before we start making changes to code. It's not something that you would run every five minutes. Um, on average, I might do it once or twice a day. Um, and that's all for the best because on large code bases, as you can imagine, it takes a while to generate that many mutations and run the tests thousands and thousands of times. So quite often our teams will run these overnight um, and then we come back in the morning and, and, and they'll get a report that says, OK, we think there might be some gaps you need to look at here. I would certainly use this technique when I inherit legacy code. So if I inherit a code base that has um, tests and I'm not sure, hmm, they're all passing and it says the, the code coverage is high, but hmm, I've seen some, some pretty um, loose tests. I've seen some some teams essentially gaming the test, the code coverage metrics by writing tests that just assert 
nothing they assert true or they just drop straight through and pass I've seen test suites where tests are commented out on all sorts of tricks so um, just because all the tests are passing and just because all the code is being covered doesn't necessarily mean that we should put 100% faith in those test suites so that's mutation testing jolly useful take a look have a play I'll post a link to the striker web page um, below have a play with your own code and see what you think